Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Richard Dreyfus to Stand By Me, River Phoenix to Explorers, James Cromwell to The Green Mile, Jeffrey DeMunn to The Shawshank Redemption, Gail Bellows to Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, Javier Botet, It. Tommy's missing. Tommy's name was in the book. There's no way it's actually connected, right? Okay, what if what happens in the book is exactly what's happened for real? Oh my god. Listen, you're in the next story. We're reading it right here. It's a corpse looking for her missing toe. <laughs> I'm afraid that we woke something up. You shouldn't have taken the book. We've got to stop it. Sarah Bellows' book, where the stories write themselves and it all comes alive. The Jangling Man is coming. Yes. All right, all right, all right. So we are trying something new today. Welcome to the Fire Pit Podcast. First ever pitch party <laughs> yes 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 oh and this was totally my idea i'm excited about this guys yes, yes. we know tom just explain the damn rules <laughs> so I'm, I'm i'm really excited about this now okay full disclosure i did borrow this idea from mary shelley and byron and how they came up with dracula and frankenstein in a cabin but we talked the other day and i gave the team a two or three word idea for a scary story and we all came up with a one or two sentence idea that we'll be pitching to each other right here and we'll pick the best one and the winner gets nothing absolutely nothing yes we told josh no std jokes and i reluctantly complied and i wholeheartedly support it as i'm tired of getting chlamydia as a joke so as the mc of this i'll start with our first pitch and the phrase was horror house wait um what was that horror house shit um something wrong there josh uh no well no but can i go last sure yeah Dan, let's hear your pitch then. All right. Yes, I think you're really going to like this one. Hold on. Okay. So I call this one Roadside Roadkill. A group of friends on a road trip see a billboard for a haunted house, and they decide to go. They make a wrong turn and end up at an abandoned house. They think it's the haunted house. They all go in for a few drinks and quickly realize that this isn't the haunted house on the billboard. By this time, they're already being killed off one by one. Ooh, now this one sounds like it has potential. Thank you, thank you. Um, I have a few notes, as you can see, that I need to flesh it out a little bit more, but that was the best I could do in two sentences. So, Tom, you're up. So my idea is called the wrong kind of host. A guy decides to host a haunted house at his home. He goes over the top and completely redecorates his house. What he doesn't know is that one of his life-size monsters he bought comes alive on Halloween and begins killing people as they go through his house unbeknownst to him. A slaughter fest! Blah! 
That's actually really good. I would totally watch that. Well, thank you, Nigel. Thank you very much. And Reginald, are you ready? Shit. Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, so mine is called Tiffany Slump, Tiffany's Scary Slumber Party. <sighs> So, Tiffany invites her best girlfriends over for a slumber party. But one of her friends invites her boyfriend over. He brings a couple of his friends and they kill them or something. Uh, I, I mean, it's a start there, Josh. But I mean, just saying this as a friend, it could probably use some work. Okay, okay. Total transparency. I might have heard whorehouse. Oh my God, porn! You you actually wrote a porn. Jesus, Josh. Okay, I know we do a lot of dick and sex jokes, but seriously, we're better than that. You didn't feel the need to get clarification about whorehouse or horror house. What? I thought I heard it right. I was in my car. The speaker sucked. Come on. Uh, so that's okay. That's okay. We can still salvage this. We'll just go to the next page. It's fine. Okay. So, this one is my sister's stick game. My sister's stick. Son of a bitch. Oh, Josh. I really should have double checked these. No, oh, God damn it. Okay, no, that's this last. Okay, let's just move on. Mm. The last pitch is running from train. I'm just gonna stop you right there. God, God damn, damn it, it, Josh. Josh. All right, baby. Let's okay. do it. Now I'm turned right. on. <laughs> okay, now this is becoming another one of Josh's porns. Hello, bots and listeners. Welcome back to a new spooky episode of the Fire Pit. I'm Dan, British name Nigel. And, well, after exploring space, we were sent to death row. Because reasons. <laughs> but we escaped! We called through shit and came out the other side clean as a whistle. All while God himself narrated the adventure. The harrowing escape ensured that the field trip to Kingtown will continue right on towards our next stop. Hope you brought your flashlights, kids, because the penultimate episode of our trip is going to be a scary one. And as per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them on to this one. So now to tell us what we're watching and who we're watching tonight, I turn things over to Josh. Why, thank you, Dan. And as mentioned before, I'm Josh, British named Reginald. And last week, we watched Jeffrey DeMunn. Our connection from the Green Mile, where he played a guard. But this last week, he helped get Tim Robbins sentenced to two consecutive life sentences in prison. Good job. If he would have just had a chat with Gil Bellows, he might have gotten the full story. Hopefully tonight, though, things are a fair little bit better for young Tommy as we follow Gil Bellows to tonight's film, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Another movie on this tour that's based on a book. And to tell us more about this film... I'm going to go ahead and toss the mic over to Thompson. Thompson? Ooh, hot potato. Got it. Thank you, Reginald. And good evening, everyone. I'm Tom, British name Thompson. And yes, tonight we view some scary stories, as only Guillermo del Toro can tell. And by that, I mean horrifyingly. Seriously, Pants Labyrinth? Anyone? Anyone? Scary stories to tell in the dark... Directed by Andre Uvredal. It's, it's Scandinavian. There's like, oh, oh that's a, a zero. It's, it's fine. Its release date was August 9th, 2019. It had a budget of 25 to $28 million and a box office of $106 million, which is pretty impressive for a late summer, early fall film. Currently, Rotten Tomato is topping off at 78% fresh with an IMDb score of 6 out of 10. Further, this film actually premiered at number two in its opening weekend, uh, topping around a little less than $21 million. So almost right away, it made its budget back. It came second to uh, Hobbs and Shaw, the spinoff of Fast and the Furious, and actually beat out Lion King, the live action, which was on its second week, and Dora and the Lost City of Gold. Yeah, and that was actually a fourth week for Lion King and Dora's first week as well. Oh, fourth week. I thought Lion King was on its second week. Nope. But number five was uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. 
Yes, it was. But that was also like on what number? Third week. Yeah, third week. So mm -hmm. not bad. Again, no. um, not bad at all. Considering this film didn't really get a lot of love in terms of ads, but then we'll talk more about that later. Uh, this movie, of course, is based on the book series of the same name, written about 1981. There are about three books taken from that collection of short stories total. Uh, this movie doesn't really seem to be an anthology film. It mostly stitches all those three stories together into one narrative about kids finding a book of horror stories that come true. Now, this movie... I'm not going to lie. I thought this movie was directed by Guillermo del Toro, but he Same. just, yeah, he just produced it along with a couple other people. I looked at their credits and guys, they, they, uh, they haven't really backed the right ponies on these ones. They've had some schlocky production credit, so it's not looking pretty in terms of that such. But the book itself, come on, we all know about this book. It was written in 1981. Uh, there's like 12 or 20 short stories to this. Uh, some of them being, these are stories, of course, that are not going to be in this movie. The Babysitter, which we might know it as The Call is Coming from Inside the House. The Hook, which is about kids making out in a car and they hear scraping. It turns out there was a serial killer with a hook for a hand. And the high beams. Someone keeps flashing a woman as she's driving. It turns out there's a serial killer in the back seat of her car. For that reason, while the movie itself doesn't seem to have a lot of anything behind it, the book series has a lot of controversy and a lot of people have been trying to get it banned for about 20 to 30 years. So a lot inspiring that. I don't know about you, but has anyone else here actually read a scary stories to tell in the dark when they were a kid? Dude, I, I read all three books, but yeah. I was like in grade school. Like Same. I don't remember the hook story or the high beam story, but I do remember one where a dude was somebody was putting together a uh, puzzle, and as they put the puzzle together, they realized that the puzzle is of their window, and they're uh, like putting the pieces together, and then they get to the corner of the window in the puzzle, and mm -hmm. then they put it down and realize there's a creature in the window looking at them, and this is of the puzzle, and then they look up to their window and they see the creature in the window. Oh God, that's scary as shit. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I I read the books too when I was a kid. In fact, I got in trouble in school for having one of them. My teacher did not like the cover, and took it away from me for the rest of the day. But the one I remember the most, and I think one of the characters from the story will be in this movie, is the Scarecrow, mm -hmm. where a couple of maybe not even kids, I think they're young men. Their car breaks down, and they go to a farmhouse. There was an old Scarecrow. I don't remember. It's been ages since I read the story, but I think they, they're trying to find tools to fix the car or something like that. And they can't. So they stay at the farmhouse for a little while and they abuse the hell out of the scarecrow. And they named the scarecrow Harold. And they finally decide that uh, we're going to have one of us is going to have to walk to town or something like that and whatever. So they leave the house and they realize they left the tools behind. So one of them was like, I got to go back and get the tools because those tools are really expensive and we can't replace them. So he walks back while somebody else waits and he never comes back. And so the other guy turns around to walk back towards the farmhouse and sees his friend or sees like basically Harold laying out his friend's skin over the like scarecrow outline or something like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm probably remembering it wrong and I'm sure the internet will be lovely in telling me exactly how I'm remembering it wrong. Um, I know that that was the beats of the story. Basically, the, the twist was other friend goes like, oh man, he hasn't shown up in a couple of days and finds out, oh no, uh, the scarecrow is actually alive and skinned him. These stories were creepy and absolutely not for children. So of course this book was marketed to children. Um, <laughs> well, you know something? Uh, okay, so I'm sitting here thinking about that story. You asked me the last week, I read this book. But then I remember thinking, it's like, well, I remember I got all three of these books at like a book fair or some shit. And then I had a friend come over. We had a, we, you know, he spent the night and I remember we were waiting until midnight to read them. And then I was thinking, why, why would we wait for midnight? I, I, I have a recollection of that being in the title. I think I'm confusing Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark with a book series very similar called Tales from the Midnight Hour. And I looked it up, and yes, I am. The Jigsaw Puzzle one is in the first book of that, because the book first book was Tales for the Midnight Hour, and then the second <laughs> was More Tales for the Midnight Hour, and the third one is still More Tales for the Midnight Hour. Right. Whereas Scary <laughs> Stories to Tell in the Dark was Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, 
more scary stories to tell in the dark. And then it was Scary Stories 3. So, yeah. Wow. I uh, I may not have read these books. Okay. You know, I, I just made a joke about how this, these stories are absolutely not for children. And, of course, so that means the book was marketed to children. But <laughs> as I became an adult, somebody was breaking down this particular story. And, honestly, they're kind of throwbacks to old school grim fairy tales. Disney has cleaned those up so much that oh, everyone so just much, assumed. Yeah. yeah. So everyone just assumes that they all had happy endings. They all married the prince and lived happily ever after and had lots of kids and everything was great in the kingdom. Uh, very rarely in grim fairy tales does that happen. Most of the time they die horribly or they're maimed. They were cautionary tales for kids. That's what they were yeah. back then. Yeah. They were cautionary. Yeah, don't go into the woods because there's a witch that lives in the woods that eats you. It's mm-hmm. telling your kids, don't go into the woods because you'll get lost. The mm-hmm. same way we tell our kids, you look both ways before crossing the street. We don't tell them to look both ways because a demon will eat them. We, we we're just don't want them to get hit by a car. Yeah, the only reason Disney went with them is because they were public domain. <laughs> yeah, and then Disney cleaned them up. Uh, to lot. the point where, uh, yeah, uh, where when they read them now, or they get out of grade school and, and high school, and then they get to college, and they read the original works, and they're like, oh my god, Ariel cut her own tail off? That's a Hans Christian Andersen story, not a Grimm. But yeah, it's like, but they, they, and they leave the part out about Sleeping Beauty and how she was actually raped. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, oh, oh, okay. They're all horrible. They all no. have a bad outcome, except for the Disney versions, which all live happily ever after with... Lots of children and the kingdom is saved and all this other stuff. And that segues beautifully into our expectations for this film. So, hey, Thompson, let's start with you. Well, I'm not going to lie, guys. Looking at the pedigree behind this film, again, Guillermo del Toro, we all know when he's doing his own work, especially when it's his own property and not someone else's intellectual property, cough, cough, Hellboy 2, or when it's just horror and nothing, you know, involving action cough cough pacific rim he's really good at it but he's not doing this this is andre overdahl and i looked at those movies he did they don't look that good troll hunter not the best i guess he did some decent short films but he's not got much else the writers on this one kevin and dan hagerman who wrote hotel transylvania in ninjago masters of spinjutsu same with the other two guys at Help Del Toro, Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan, who did Saws 4 to the final chapter. These guys don't have a lot of creepy, spooky to their name. There's a lot of like jump scare. Wah! The actors, too, not a lot behind them. Gil Bellows, of course, he's been in a lot of stuff uh, ranging from the. I haven't heard of this film, but it sounds interesting to, I might have heard of this, and there's a good reason I've forgotten about it. I'm, I'm rambling. There's the short of it is, nothing's really engendering me to this. It doesn't look particularly good. It just looks like your standard, boo, jump scare, sort of CG-tastic, quote-unquote creepy horror film. The stories look like they're all based on the ones where the kids die, so... I'm expecting that much, but... Your expectations are fairly low. To the ground, yes. The kid actors might be all right, but this, the movies surrounding them is going to suck. At least that's me. I've been wrong before. It might surprise me, but Josh, what about you? Well, it's funny because my expectations were really low with Swashbuckler, and I was disappointed with that film. i got to say, okay, I've watched maybe 10, 15 minutes of this movie. Like, I tried to sit down and watch it from the beginning with my daughter. Did she see it at that point? I don't remember. But it's like we got about 15 minutes into the movie, and I was kind of bored. And she left, and then my son left, and then I just turned on something else. But I will say she had a friend over, and they were watching it. And I came down into the basement where they were watching it to try to scare them because I'm a terrible father. And I did sit and watch for about another five minutes or so. And the scene I watched was actually pretty creepy. Because it's like you, Tom. I thought that this was directed by Guillermo del Toro, too. Because he's really good with practical effects. And, like, the costumes of the monsters, they screamed Guillermo del Toro. I love the Hellboy series. I love Pacific Rim. And, like, you could see his spin on it. So that's why I thought, heart to God, I thought he was the director. And I was surprised when I saw that he wasn't. But that being said, given what the quality of the movie and everything about it. My bar isn't to the ground, but uh, I would say my expectations aren't super high. I'm not I'm not going into this expecting a lot. I mean, how often do you see, especially in anthology series, adapted well? 
especially uh, in an August release. Yeah, I'm, I'm tr- right off the top of my head. I'm saying almost none. Nothing's yeah. coming to my head. So yeah, 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 yeah. But it, it did make a decent amount of money. So Dude, yeah, it made. Uh, it was on a budget of twenty five million dollars. It made twenty million in its first weekend with over a hundred million made total domestically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, obviously it had people watch it, and it was made five almost five times its budget or four times its budget. I honestly, it got like a six something uh, on IMDb, which. So did Swashbuckler. So I'm not expecting to think that this movie is the next greatest movie. So my expectations aren't super high. So what about you, Nigel? Well, um, I'm I'm actually more nervous about our track record going into movies where all three of us haven't seen it than I am the actual movie itself. Yep. Um, because our track record of us going into a movie is not good. We hated Pathfinder. We hated Swashbuckler. We hated Dead Calm. I will say this, though, Tom. You were saying that Guillermo del Toro, when it's someone else's intellectual property, he's not that great. But when it's his own, he's really good. As underwhelming as Hellboy 2 was, compared to the newest Hellboy movie, it's Shakespeare. And as much of a turn-your-brain-off popcorn flick Pacific Rim was, Pacific Rim 1 was much better than Pacific Rim 2. So his when he's not involved, his presence is... Noted noted or his lack of presence is noted so i know he's not directing this movie but he's he's a producer so i'm interested to see what his presence will be in this movie going in i've read these books they're good books but a lot of those stories like the guy with the hook and uh, some of the others have already been adapted to other media or bits and pieces taken out of them in fact there was a movie in the 90s i think or early 2000s called Urban Legend, where the killer was mimicking some urban legends, and some of them were some of the stories out of here, mm-hmm. like uh, the high beam story and the um, the hook hand story and all that. I will say this though: the trailer did nothing for me. I watched the trailer for this film, and I know trailers are supposed to get you to buy tickets and get your butt in the seat. And if uh, the, this trailer would make me go pass, so my expectations are pretty low for this film. I don't think it's going to be that good. I think visually it'll be okay, but I don't like the premise. It looks like the kids go somewhere, find a book with these particular stories where they come to life. And I'm like, I don't know. Just the premise isn't selling me. Quick question. Did either of you know about the movie around the time it was released, though? No, I don't remember a single trailer for this film before it came out. I remember seeing something online maybe on reddit or something that the movie when it was in pre-production or principal photography now i know we were in a pandemic and i i can't remember the last time i was at the movies because it really does feel like 20 years ago i was in a movie theater but i don't remember a single trailer for this film and also the fact that this is a perfect halloween movie and it came out in august that's another red flag like why wouldn't you release this movie in october or early november like that's when this kind of movie should be released it, it's not a summer movie i think it was released august 9th or 10th weekend of the 11th yeah yeah, yeah, no, I missed correctly uh, said that it came out in like March, but I was in, I was very wrong on that. In yeah, it's like, episode. I mean, I, look, I, I may be wrong. We, we uh, may all be wrong. This movie made money on a budget of, of less than 30 million and it made 106 of it back. Yeah, it made money. I don't know. I, it just it feels like this movie was just so under the radar. I think I was mentioning before we started recording that a lot of the YouTubers and movie reviewers that I watch on YouTube or listen to their podcasts, I don't remember an episode of any of them about this movie, good, mm-hmm. bad or otherwise. Yeah, Josh. Gosh, when you recommended this at first, it was like, oh, did they release it directly to Netflix already? Like, no, they released it in 2019. First, I'd heard of it. Like, Nigel, I'd never seen trailer one. When I pulled the trailer audio, that was the first time I'd seen the trailer, period. And like Nigel said, yeah, didn't turn me on at all. Nope. So surprised the hell out of me. Yeah, see, and... I knew it was in theaters when it was in theaters, only because I apparently missed correctly remembered that uh, I read these books as a kid, mm-hmm. but I, I remember reading about it. I'm like, oh, well, I'm not going to go watch that in theaters, but I'll definitely catch it when it comes out on a DVD. I don't even think I have seen a trailer for it. So yeah, I'm right there with you. It's like, I think that like I only knew about it because I'd known about the books growing up. I watched the trailer before I wrote the script for this week's episode, just because I wanted to see what the premise of the movie was, whether it was going to be an anthology film or something like that. And I don't remember seeing it on TV or uh, in theaters. It's like this movie came and went. It's the most under the radar $106 million I've ever seen in my life. Like it's just a movie that made this much profit 
shouldn't be this forgotten. Now, I will give it this much. Hobbs and Shaw was being pushed hard. Oh, my God. Yeah. The one good thing about Hobbs and Shaw being out in theaters is I didn't have to watch that fucking trailer anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Right, right. It's, it's easy to think, like, I, I don't remember which studio produced or released this movie, but I'm thinking, yeah, Hobbs and Shaw had the bigger marketing budget. Which is, which is another thing. Why would you release this movie next to Hobbs and Shaw, which has The Rock and it's got Idris Elba and it's part of the Fast and the Furious franchise, which you can say whichever you want about the quality of those movies. But with the exception of Tokyo Drift, those fuckers make money and everyone loves them for dumb, stupid movies that they are. And this movie comes out and competes with Hobbs and Shaw. Why? This movie is a Halloween movie. You release this movie in October. You do not release it in August. I wonder if they released it in August so that they could pull off some of that summer box office money. Because, I mean, box office typically settles down to a low between September, October, November. Because kids are back in school, you're not going to take them to see the theaters. And I wonder if it would have done as well had they released it in later months. I don't know. I don't know if it would have done better if they'd released it in October as opposed to August. I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that horror movies and scary movies do tend to come out in October. Now I know that that's mostly dominated by slasher rated R films that kids Mm -hmm. can't go to. So I I really don't know. I just feel like this movie may have missed its audience and that's why it's so forgettable. Well, gentlemen, I'm looking at what was released around the same time during this. And from September 6th, the weekend of September 6th, it chapter two came out and the weekend of October 4th, Joker came out. Well, I know that It Chapter 2 was heavily marketed and there was a lot of buzz going into It Chapter 2. And there's a lot yeah. of buzz going into Joker too. So maybe yeah, they released it in August. See, uh, if you're going to go see a scary movie fall 2019, you're going to go see uh, Joker, It, or Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Mm-hmm. Where would you put your money in on those? Yeah, they may not have been confident that it was going to compete with either of those films. So that may be doing it. And of course, uh, remember when Dark Knight came out and someone decided to also release... Civil War? Are you talking uh, uh, Mama 2016? Mia. Mama, no, Mamma Mia. The Dark Knight ran up against Mamma Mia because <laughs> they were trying to say that not everyone's going to want to go to the theater to go uh, see okay, Batman. Yeah, yeah they, were saying, they, they were trying to market it like, hey, if you're taking the families to the movies to go see Batman, but you got members of the family that don't want to see Batman, go see Mamma Mia. And it turns out, no, everyone in my household wants to see Batman. And that could be this case here it's like everyone wants to go see Hobbs and Shaw but they're like but some people may want to see this film based on a childhood book Um, because you don't like the Fast and the Furious so we're going to go ahead and see if we can collect a couple pennies left (laughs) off by Hobbs and Shaw I mean it worked on paper it worked it made its money back and then some mission accomplished but Mm -hmm. I guarantee if I try to compete against it chapter two or Joker well I can't say it would have been lost in the shuffle and forgotten because it was lost in the shuffle and forgotten you know. And no one's saying it sucks, so I mean, it's not one of those films that's so bad everyone talks about it or so good, so maybe yeah, like, we'll all be happy and it's just like middle ground. Real quick before we get to this quiz that Dan so amazingly curated for us, I wanted to give a quick thank you to all of our new listeners, because we're getting more and more every day, our, our new listeners and our new subscribers. Josh, Josh, do we, do we have to do this part? Yeah. Yes? It's just, it's so tacky. Everyone does this. <sighs> Yeah, but it helps. I know, but it feels so generic. I mean, if they're already listening, I'm sure they'll like and subscribe to whatever podcast platform you use. And again, leave a review, <laughs> too. Uh, yeah, we, we like those. Thank you. We might actually read some on air if you do leave them. So like and subscribe. So anywho. Uh, was that a, was that a good transition, there, Josh? That okay. was just, that was beautiful. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I honestly thought you were complaining, Dan. It's like, wait, oh shit, are we actually going to fight? What? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> these are lines. You know oh. what, you fucker, you fuckers do this without me. I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> You'll be no. hearing from my agent. <laughs> you do not work with me. You work for me. <laughs> I'm the Homelander. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the fucking Homelander. So but Nigel. Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'm just going to do the usual trivia. I'm going to go off on some scary stories reviews on IMDb, and then I might give a little trivia with each answer. But uh, what I want to do, though, is I'm going to change the rules here for a little bit, because honestly, Josh, we're all tired of getting your STDs. 
So we need I to change I am. Yeah, <laughs> we need to change things up a little bit. So the winner, quote unquote, of the quiz every week does it the following week. I like that rule. That's, yeah, a, that's good a good rule. one. It's a good yeah. one. I'm tired of uh, yeah. giving you guys all the STDs. It's more stable. It's kind of challenging, and it's less crotch itchy. The STDs have definitely ran their course. Let yeah. this be the antibiotic to burn it out. Yeah, this uh, quiz section certainly needed a shot of penicillin. Can we go back to making porno <laughs> jokes? <laughs> Future Here at the Fire Pit <laughs> Podcast, you only get the best. And pornographic references and STDs. If you discovered this podcast in the future when we actually got good and then worked your way back to this episode, we're very sorry. We were still <laughs> finding our sorry. footing. So I'm going to change things up, though, a little bit. I'm not going to read the title of the review, and I'm not going to read the first sentence of the review. I'm going to read the last sentence of the review. Oh, God damn it! That was going to be my thing next time I did them. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> oh, I had no idea. <laughs> Nigel with I never the told steel. you. <laughs> <laughs> How dare Nigel. you take the idea I never no. told you about? The only way, the only one I'm not going to read is the last sentence is if they give the review score in the last sentence. Like if they would, if they say, I highly recommend nine out of 10, you're not going to, you can obviously guess the score then. So I'm going to read the last sentence of the review. And then you tell me what score out of 10 you think this is. And now let me write Josh's name and write, ha ha, I got to it first, dickhead, in parentheses, and write Tom's name, ha ha, you didn't even think of this, dickhead. So That's all right. I'm going to edit all of your <laughs> shit. Man. Sound terrible. So, anywho. All right. So, here we go. You guys ready? Yep. Okay. It's not clear who its target audience is, as it's too scary for kids, but also too childish for most teen and adult viewers. Hmm. Thompson? And this, we, we have to guess between 1 and 10, so I'm yeah. going to say this sounds like a 6, really. Also, still Price is Right rules, whoever the closest wins the point. Well, I think this is a higher review. I'm going to go 7. Well, Tom, what did you say? 6. Tom is closest. It's a 4. Oh, damn. That's, that sounds fairly harsh. Yeah. Do they say anything else about it or just... Uh, they, they basically say that the movie that doesn't know what it wants to be. Like, does it want to be a scary movie for kids? But it's too chi It's too scary for kids. But the jokes, I guess, or the the story of this movie is too not not mature yet for teen or young adults. Okay. It's it's not quite a teen horror like I know you, what you did last summer or Scream, mm -hmm. but it's also not a kitty scary movie like Goosebumps. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like they're saying it, it was trying to be something in between Goosebumps and the teen horrors, but fails to be either one. So, you know, honestly, That's that makes a little sense. I mean, it was a kid's film, and most 80s and 90s kids read those books, so it's like you want to tailor it to younger kids, but also to the original audience of these books. The challenge of slicing the nostalgia pie. Um, so, points to Tom. Yay! Yeah, points to Tom. And I'm doing five of these, so best of five. Okay. All right. Where's the other one I had? This is a good one. I'm not reading that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> good start. Was that is that the line? Am I supposed to guess? Uh... <sighs> okay. As a synthesis, it's an effective teen movie for getting started with cinematography thrills. Or cin cinematog cinema. That's not a word. IMDb <laughs> user. Anyways, cinematographic thrills as a synthesis an efficient teen movie for getting cinematographic thrills i, I am very smart you, you have yeah. no idea yeah yes, you, you i got all of my information <laughs> off youtube the spell checker did not correct me therefore it must be a word no the no the, the red wavy lines mean it's a good word and i should keep using it <laughs> nine i'm saying this is a nine i'm gonna go with a six Josh gets the point. It's a five. Damn. I was going to say five. Yeah, the title is called Light, Soft, and Mediocre. So. Nice. So one to and, one, Thompson. Uh, mm, neck and neck. I like this. All mm, right. One Ooh. last note. Here, here you go. Here you go. One last note. For a modern PG-13 horror film, Scary Stories is far more gruesome than all the aforementioned films I mentioned, while still managing to be infinitely less scary and well-made. These all sound like middle to low reviews. Josh, you, I'm letting you go first on this one. Well, technically, I was supposed to go first on the last one, but I'm going to go four. I'm going to say one. Tom's closest at the two. Oh, I knew I should have went with two. 
It will be Josh, though. Ha 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 ha. Fuck you, two to one. <laughs> okay, this one's gonna really throw you guys off. Got my blanket, went to the cinema, and it was like a sweet lullaby. Ten out of ten for the best sleep I've ever experienced. <laughs> well, Josh, since I went two in a row, I'm gonna let you go two in a row. I'm gonna say a two. <laughs> I'm going to be that dick and say a three. You both are off, but technically Tom is closest. It's a 10 star review. Bullshit. No, it's a, ten, it's a 10 star review. I'm not lying to the 10 star review. And it's one fucking sentence. It says, got my blanket, went to the cinema. And it was like a sweet lullaby. 10 out of 10 for the best sleep I've ever experienced. Son of a bitch. They even told us what they gave. Yeah, I, that's why I said this one's really going to throw you guys off. You told us it wasn't gonna give the star review and the you liar. Yeah, I, no, I said it would throw you off. I said it would throw you off. So well, Tom, Tom wins. Yeah, there's. And I was supposed to do the next two weeks. Damn it. Ah, too bad. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, <laughs> That's okay. Tom wins, so Tom gets to do the trivia quiz. Whatever you want to do it next week. Uh, we don't always have to do IMDb reviews. If you guys want to try to find something else, you can. But um, I kind of like trying to guess IMDb scores because people are weird when they write. It is yes, they our are. Stick. Yep. Yeah. I like Not, it. It's like we don't get enough comments, cough, cough, join our Discord, to really acknowledge whether or not people like these. So we like them, so we keep doing them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So until you guys tell us differently, the only thing I have to say to that is, uh, Tom, play the music. Da 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 da. <laughs> another spine tingly episode of the fire pit i am as always your interspersal host editor and crypt keeper tom <laughs> Ooh, and it seems we just received this message from beyond the grave let's see what the spirits will have of us ah. <sighs> Your use of Crypt Keeper constitutes copyright infringement in violation of U.S. copyright laws, and we demand you immediately cease and desist or face penalties of up to... <clears throat> but thank you for sharing some scary stories to tell in the dark with us as we continue on our field trip to Kingtown. There's been some growing... There's been some stargazing. There's even been some hard times. But just one last stop, and then it. <laughs> and speaking of screaming into the unanswering darkness, how about some ads? Dan, are you ready? Yes, yes, I am. Ready for what? One, two. two. Three congratulations. congratulations! Congratulations for what? Oh, we figured it was high time you said something on this podcast about your new bundle of joy. Yeah, we know how it's gonna keep you up late into the night. Oh, guys, thank you. Oh, yeah, you know it's been a real blessing. I can't believe I waited so long to have one of my own, and it's been such an experience. Well, don't hold out on us. So tell us a little bit about her. Well, okay, so she's got an AMD Ryzen 5 3600 six core processor. That's 3.59 gigahertz processing power, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and Top it all off, a Radeon RX 580 series GPU so I can game with the best of the gamers without any kind of clipping or latency. And I got some Bluetooth wireless, the bells that come with their own whistle. It's so beautiful. Look at she's all he's zooming right there. Aww. Aww. So cute. Yeah, Rob's custom PCs really outdid themselves. Like, Rob built this baby I'm currently using to edit this podcast, and it's such a wonderful beauty. If you're looking to have one of your own, Rob will build any PC for any budget. 
whether you want to game, stream, code, or if you just need a new media center to watch all these great movies with us here at the Fire Pit. You can even get a custom build in addition to a few pre-builds for any price. Uh, you can find a link to his business Facebook page, facebook.com slash Rob's Custom PCs, or just look for a link in this episode description on firepit.podbean.com. Again, it's Rob's Custom PCs. As a reminder, if you want us to scream out your products, or just want to scream at us directly, give us an email at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just type fire pit in the subject line. And whether you're emailing for an ad, comment, recommendation, or corrections, and tell us your story. And then the words will magically appear on our inbox for us to read. Then magically never get a response. Is this a coincidence? Or is it some kind of deviltry? We may never know. That email once more is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Capital C, capital C, capital E capital I at gmail.com uh, and now how about we swoop in and see how the team is enjoying their bite of this haunting film blah blah let's focus on this and not on potential Netflix pedophilia yeah. yes okay middle kid is very relatable I like him he's gonna die gruesomely and you clearly didn't think things through. Yeah, they're in a Pontiac from the 60s. That thing's like a tank. Yeah, it could stop a train. <laughs> Wait. Oh. <laughs> Casual arson. Just think, if you weren't a bully, that never would have happened. Kids watching us nowadays don't have to ask about these drive-in theaters. They're like, oh, yeah, uh, drive-in theaters. That's what we did during the COVID. Was there a pandemic back then, too? No, it was just the norm. It was just the 60s. It was terrible on its own. It was either go to the drive-in or go to Vietnam, and neither one sounded appealing. I hate that it's still a taboo to go to the movies alone. Well, drive-in movies have a certain, um, <clears throat> expectation. Sex. He's talking about sex. I got it, Josh. I mean, clearly it worked out for this guy because, you know, he just sat in the car and chicken sat next to him with two dudes in the back, so... It might be into that kind of thing. You never know. Well, that's definitely a setup for one of your stories, Josh. Yeah, sounds like something you would have submitted. Yeah, we hate it when people just talk about how her mom left her just without her knowing, you know. It's totally rude when people to do that. We would never do that because we're her friends. But, you know, it's the exposition. Classic scary story setup. Let's go into that old abandoned house. Ooh, I'm going to scare you, jump scare. Ooh. Don't worry, guys, we've got at least one kid of color with us. So at least the three of us white people <laughs> will be okay. Dude, she's got to be all of 13. You might want to pump the brakes a little bit. I love how the adult in the next uh, car just is like staring straight forward. Yeah, like, um, pay no mind to these teenagers with ball bats. Oh, it's one of those pens where you turn it upside down and the girl gets naked. Porn in the 60s. I don't think people realize just how heartbroken that kid was when his pen got broke. It's like, oh my god. Back in the day, boobs were hard to see. Dude, it was yeah, hard that's... to see boobs up until like the late 90s. Yeah. And then dial-up sucked. Yeah. You got one or two pictures, you were happy. Because yeah. if you saved those to your hard drive, you ran out of space. Yeah, unless you had a subscription to National Geographic, you didn't see any boobs. And even those boobs, you didn't really want to see much of. Yeah. Okay, so the book is like Death Note. I've never seen Death Note, so I don't know if that's right or not. I'm just saying, if I had a book that, you know, everything I wrote became real, I wouldn't be writing scary stories. It's a good thing cops aren't racist anymore. I know, right? Again, another no-no. You are in a hidden room in an abandoned house with a possible corpse, and you started playing the music box. You want to die. Look, I wasn't a mean kid in school, but if the number one school Billy went missing when I was in school, I'd probably be singing a song. Yeah. yeah. Do you hear about Tommy? He's missing. Don't you go teasing me with a good time. So this is like Teen Wolf, only Scarecrow? Yes. Teen Scarecrow? 
He's a little stuffed. Hey now. Hey. God damn it. <laughs> dun dun dun. Oh, gross. You would taste a toenail. I picked a bad time to eat. <laughs> okay, reload. Reload. Why are you not reloading? Strange things did happen when Nixon got elected. Now that's a real horror story. <laughs> hey, there's your train, Josh. Oh, jeez. They're racing the train. Oh, that's what we should have called it. <laughs> your use of Bella Lugosi constitutes copyright. Oh, looks like I need to go have a word with my attorneys. Again, I'll let you get back to the show. Thank you all for listening. And as always, good luck. <laughs> The end. Yeah. Well, while this is playing, Nigel, do you want to give your summary section? Okay. So the movie opens in 1968 in America uh, in a town called, I almost said Hill Valley from Back to the Future, but no, it's Mill Valley. So the movie opens up 1968, Mill Valley. The radio announcer is talking about how this small town in America has been haunted by the ghost of a witch named Sarah Bellows. And uh, he's talking about it all over the radio. The towns get ready for Halloween, trick-or-treat night. And we're introduced to this uh, girl. Her dad's asking if she wants to go out trick-or-treating. She says no, but then her friends call her on the walkie-talkies. And they say that, well, you have to come out because it's like our last Halloween together. So you need to come out with us. So she meets up with her friends. They all dress in costumes. They go out to trick or treat, but they also bring pranks. And the school bully tries to steal their candy, but they gave him like a bag of dirty diapers or dirty underwear or something like that. And then they threw poop in his car, but the poop was flaming. So that really pissed the guy off. Um, and then they hide out in a drive through and they meet another guy and he helps them by hide, letting them hide in his car. And then they talk to him and then they go to a haunted house where Sarah Bellows lives because they're talking about the legend of Sarah Bellows. And they find a hidden room in the house. And because they're idiots, they they go in the hidden room and because they're even more idiots they play the music box and because they're really idiots they take a book and they take it with them and the book is cursed and the book starts writing scary stories and they happen to be scary stories to tell in the dark and those stories come to life and each one of the friends keeps getting picked off uh, the school bully gets turned into a scarecrow the one kid gets pulled under the bed and never comes out again another one she goes completely insane when spiders pop out of her face which I mean come on who wouldn't then the others one of them gets absorbed into the giant witch in the red room so anyways all the friends getting picked off one by one till it's only car guy and girl at the beginning of the movie i don't remember their names they ramon are ramon possibly and, and stella um, that's her stella stella so uh ramon and stella are running around and the, this other demon comes down the chimney in parts i think he's called the gangly man he reassembles himself and then kills the sheriff who forgot to reload and they get the keys off the sheriff's body they escape their jail cells and they run around back to the haunted house where the girl takes the book and she gets taken like from other ghosts i think were they other ghosts anyways they were other ghosts put her in a room where they used to hold sarah and then sarah is a ghost and sarah tries to say i have a story for you but the other girl says no i have a story for you and they take a pen and pricks her finger puts the blood in there and then starts writing a story about how her sarah Bellows was innocent and great and fantastic and everyone loved her and this is like not fair that what happened to her so sarah lifts the curse gangly man falls apart before he can kill ramon and da -da! ends up saving the day but uh ramon goes into the army and is probably going to head to vietnam so suddenly gangly man's probably not that bad of a thing to handle and that's the end although there's an obvious sequel hook when she says my friends are still missing but a way to get him out is in the book and then the car drives off saying uh, stella will appear in the next movie it doesn't say that but it definitely implies it i love how you left out the toe well i mean I, I mentioned her friends are getting picked off one by one by different stories uh, also, I, didn't, I didn't mention the toe but i did mention the fate the fate of the guy was he was the one that got pulled under the bed and then i also mentioned the sheriff died because he forgot to reload yeah which total amateur move. yeah noob move noob move i mean it's, it's like me when i play call of duty i always reload when everyone's coming out to fight me oh this thing's putting itself together i'm just gonna stare at it the whole yeah. time Ay, ay, ay. To be fair, to be fair, yeah. to be fair, if a disassembled body fell out of your fireplace and was talking to you and moving on its own, you might lose control of your bowels too. Well, he shot at the head first. Yeah, but then everything rained out of the fireplace. So I, I don't blame the guy. Uh, I would have shot saying... myself too and probably forgotten. I'm not disputing the fact that he 
that that's not realistic that he didn't freeze and die. But anyways, mm -hmm. that's my summary, and I'm sticking to it. That's a good summary. Well said, Nigel. Thank you. What, Th Thompson, let's hear your uh, final thoughts after watching scary stories to tell in the dark. It fucking sucked. <laughs> Christ. Is my scary voice not spooky enough for you? Oh, no, the voice was fine. The movie itself sucked. This was along the same lines as Final Destination. The whole thing was just, how are these people going to die? And apparently they didn't really die? Except maybe the bully? I don't know. I'll give it some kudos. The production was pretty good. It it did look very 1960s, some good attention to details. It looked very lived in. It didn't seem like fresh and new 1960s. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole film did have a very 1980s The Soldier film to it, shot kind of a lot like Stranger Things, uh, kids on bikes, walkie-talkies, all the tropes that we're seeing now. But there was really no connecting narrative to this. It was a conceit of they find a book of scary stories that are magic and make them come to life, and they stop it somehow. There's no narrative reason why these stories would keep happening like this. It's not like they initiated the curse by opening a spell or by even from stealing it. There was nothing like any other story of this type where they had to do this thing to stop it. It's just, oh, now she sees the girl, and that's all it was. I'm comparing it to there was a, a similar film with short stories, but they're all connected by the same narrative called Trick or Treat. And that was well done. Each one played into one another, and there's a reason they were all happening. There was no reason for any of this happening except it was written in the book. It was not torture porn, but jump scare porn, I guess. I don't know. I can't. I'm sure someone will come up with a genre for this. So that's why I'm giving this one a shit grade. This is a flaming shit bag that was thrown in the car wow tell us how you really feel tom so Don't out of like if you if you would group this in making it four air quotes bad movies that we've watched so far mm -hmm. where would you rank this in terms of best best being the number one worst being number four right now i'm saying middle but i know how this is going to feel i'm getting a lot of green mile tastes to this which two movies do you think would be better because I mean, you got Swashbuckler, Deadcom, Pathfinder, and this. Oh, this is definitely better than all three of these. Yeah. No, don't get me wrong. I well, will that's what I was trying to get you to say. <laughs> that's what I felt like it was implied. But then. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. You're you're right. You're absolutely right. I am being a bit harsher on this film than I probably should be. It's shit. Lowercase. Those films are shit italicized, bold, 20 size font, all caps. So you kind of put this in the same grouping as, say, movies like Aquaman. Yeah, or Green Mile, or any of those. Actually, mm. I put this along the same line as Aquaman. They're both serviceable, but both just shit films. Uh, I'd, I could have this in the background and not feel inclined to turn it off or change it. So that's that's my initial thought. I can, I'll add and subtract as we discuss, but I guess, Nigel, you would be next. Okay. So um, I will say it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, but it most certainly was not a good film, at least not for me. It wasn't to my taste. I kind of agree with one of the IMDb reviews where it was like, this movie wants to be more adult than Goosebumps, but less adult than Final Destination and kind of failed at both of them. And I don't know if that's because they were trying to market the movie to kids, but also play on the nostalgia so that the adults would take their kids to the movie because, hey, I read these books when I was a kid. You guys are going to love them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Just, this movie just, it was so, both the beginning and the end ending, the beginning of the movie and the end of the movie were both jumbled messes, really hard to follow, really hard to figure out what was going on. Like the middle of the movie wasn't too bad. I, I understood what was going on, but like the beginning when they were trying to establish the characters, I was just kind of like, going, what is going on? Who are these people? Like it was just going too fast. And then the end of the movie, they went from the police station to the street, to the house, to the basement, to the insane asylum, like all in 10 minutes. And I just, had a hard time following where they were going. I don't know. Maybe I need to watch it again, but, but I don't want to. So <laughs> I, I'm just going to say I, my final thoughts is that it was, it was kind of jumbled and maybe I don't, I'm not in the audience for this because I've never been the biggest fan of scary movies anyways, at least 
movies that are supposed to be like scary. So this one just didn't do anything for me. It had decent special effects. I thought the CG was pretty good. I could definitely see Guillermo del Toro's fingerprints all over it, but I didn't care for it. Josh, what about you? Well, I hate you because you stole all my final thoughts. Oh, shit. My bad. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's I, like I don't know why. but the third time I've yeah, done that tonight. <laughs> dude, I, I was even thinking to myself, so, you know, I'm going to reference that one review that we talked about earlier about how they said it couldn't. I'm going to do a callback to that one. I'm going to talk about how, you know, Guillermo del Toro, you could feel him in there. But no, thanks, Dan. <laughs> In Nigel's defense, I did go out of order. You were second on the list. I know. (laughs) So I guess either way, it would have been you walking over my uh, closing comments or vice versa. But uh, I will say, not to parrot everything that you said, but I do agree with a lot of that. That I see what that guy was saying in terms of, don't know if they're going for the adult or the children as their target audience here. I honestly think that the movie did a phenomenal job of replaying the stories and building up the, just in the small segments, it did a really good job on those segments. But I do agree with you guys that connecting them, it didn't do the greatest job. Trying to put them all into a single cohesive story, it really failed on that. And I honestly, I probably would have said this is a good movie, but the ending, it really let me down. I'm like, this is what you're tying this up with? That's not even a bow. It's like you were cleaning out the toilet and then you decided to wrap this up yeah. without washing your hands. Yeah. Or and... even flushing, if you would uh, pardon the imagery of that. Well, I was trying to get at that, but I didn't want to be as graphic. So thank you for that, Tom. <laughs> Welcome, Josh. We're doing a great job to you today. <laughs> but like I said, I thought the special effects, the practical effects, the CGI, I thought everything was really well done. I thought the kids did a great job acting. The setting was done very well. I mean, you know, especially the way they played it, all the election stuff in the background, it really told you without really telling you what year it is. It's not like they're like, hey, look at that calendar over there. Let's pan over and have them talking about the election in an obvious way. They didn't treat the audience as being dumb, but at the same time, they forgot that they were telling a story, especially nearer the end it's just like fuck how are we going to tie these together i'm just mm-hmm. repeat what i've been saying but that those basically my thoughts i would have to say I, if i was to give this a rating it would be a mediocre rating i don't think it's anything special but i don't think it's the worst thing we've seen i agree with tom where you say it's on par with aquaman but aquaman entertained me like i was into aquaman the whole time i was watching it this movie i i honest to god i had the hardest time in the world following it towards the end like mm-hmm. i couldn't figure out what the hell was going on so oh, yeah it's like this movie didn't keep my attention the entire time going through it's like in terms of keeping my attention aquaman did a better job in terms of storytelling i don't i couldn't tell you which one's better now josh did you find this movie scary at all there was a few parts that i was legitimately a little scared at like the part with this do and the toe i thought that was pretty scary i thought that the javier botet uh, monster was really creepy but you know he's good at that like i said the practical effects were really well done i thought that that creepy white lady that absorbed the one kid she was definitely creepy so like as far as being scared it, it got me a couple of times but none of the jump scares got me Like when he got pulled under the bed, that jump scare didn't get me because, you know, by that point you were expecting it. But the design of the creepy old lady and how they built up to that, I thought was pretty creepy. I I think that lends itself to Guillermo del Toro's fingerprints. Yeah. Some of the design there. He definitely fingered the shit out of this movie. (sighs) You just couldn't just just not one time with the restraint. Huh? Okay. (laughs) <laughs> well, apparently the scariest part of this whole experience has been Josh. Josh has been the horror aspect of this. Event. I do write a good horror story. Horror. Or- <laughs> Nigel, did you find this scary at all? Uh, I found parts of it more creepy than scary. Like, I, I'm with Josh. The jump scare under the bed thing, I saw that coming a mile away. So when it actually happened, didn't do anything for me. Because it's just like, it was so obvious. They might as well have just been flashing on the screen, jump scare incoming, jump scare incoming, jump scare incoming. You couldn't have telegraphed it that much. Um, So that part didn't scare me. I will say that the Javier Botet monster was creepy looking. The evil witch in the red room or whatever she was, that was creepy. That was right out of the book. And I thought the scarecrow, Harold looked creepy and i thought the scene where the kid was turning into the scarecrow was kind of creepy and very well done mm-hmm. but um as far as scary goes i don't know maybe it's not scary to me because i'm not my daughter's age like i maybe if i was in the 11 12 13 year old range maybe i'd find it scary mm-hmm. but you know 39 year old me is like nope 
not really. Creepy, yes, but not scary. More like a really high budgeted episode of the Goosebumps TV show. I see. I agree with you on that one. The some of the editing and directing was not tight enough to really bring out the creepy, scary, like the red room white lady things. Like some of those cuts, just like, oh, this is a mild inconvenience. I was I didn't feel scared at all. In fact, I almost laughed a little. It seemed like a comedy. Certain points I expected to his face just get more like seriously. Yeah, come on, this is like he, sneak yeah. around the bitch. Come on. Yeah, like I've I'll be honest. There's been there's episodes of Supernatural that have scared me more than any moment. In this God movie. damn it, Dan. What? <laughs> I was gonna say it reminded me a lot of season one of Supernatural. <laughs> <laughs> You need to react faster, Josh. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I was waiting on. for him to finish. Josh and I got a we got a vibe going tonight. I don't know what's going on. How about no. uh, let's uh, let's Josh finish your thought on this? Yeah, one. yeah, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, finish my thought about Supernatural. <laughs> I was just gonna say, yeah, a lot of it was that creepy vibe, like season one of Supernatural. Like season one of Supernatural, I felt was the only season of you know the thirty seasons that got me scared and creeped me out. Like this movie did, because like I, I agree, I wasn't really scared at all during this movie. Like maybe the one scene where the creepy girl was walking around saying, "Where's my toe?" Yeah, it reminded me a lot of uh, season one of Supernatural. Eh, the fact that there's a sequel hook is just another thing that adds to the why this is bullshit list. Like, come on, commit. And that's probably just a fault of Hollywood in general these days, but I just don't understand the need to set up a universe first before we can just tell a story. Mm -hmm. And I think that I mentioned earlier, I watched Venom for the first time, and that wasn't a great movie, but I appreciated the fact that they told their own story without focusing too much on trying to build a universe before they finished their story. And this movie was the same way. Like, the sequel hook was kind of like, eh, I don't know. It's like, I'm not that interested, but okay. And the the fact that they showed that one girl who supposedly went insane from the spiders, she's with them and she's okay. Do her parents know she's out of the insane asylum? Who knows? Yeah. Uh, no, this, this movie wasn't great. This It really, you know, really. Like I said, I, I would give it like a five or a six out of ten. It was a mediocre movie. Yeah. Like if you see it on TV, you might turn it on and, but, you know, wander away from the room. I think out of all of the movies that the three of us have gone in blind, this is the best one. I agree. But it's still not a great movie. And this is definitely, the so far, having not seen it yet, the low point on the field trip to Kingtown. Mm -hmm. um, and on that note, I think, Josh, I'll let you segue us into the final one since uh me and nigel have kind of stepped on your toes a little <laughs> bit here tonight <laughs> it's been more you know i think we've been doing this long enough that maybe our uh thought patterns are getting to that point where we're starting to think the same things <laughs> i can see that our periods are essentially yeah where our periods are, are, are synchronizing <laughs> yeah well you know it does happen yeah but if you want to segue reginald yeah well i could really segue this i mean because you know what Next week we are gonna watch it. What, what are we watch? What are we watching again? Yeah, what are we watching? Good lord! Again, we're gonna watch it. Yeah. What are we watching next week? Your job. You have one job in tonight's episode, and that is to tell us what we're watching next week. We're gonna watch it. All right. Tommy's ah. not being very cooperative. Okay. So I, I guess I'll take it over. So next week we're going from scary stories to tell in the dark to watching it. Oh, the 2017 remake of it. That's a good movie. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> ah! Yes. Ah! Ah! <laughs> thank you, thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. <laughs> mwah, mwah. Try yes. the veil. Try the veil and tip your servers. <laughs> <laughs> We've given Tom a lot to edit this week. It's like we're on. We're we're approaching hour five here, and like Tom's got a lot to edit this week. So, so you wanted to so work? We're showing this episode next next tuesday right <laughs> right so all right you know what fuck you guys dan i think you have somebody you need a shout out uh always 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 anyway a uh, special shout out to peggy friend of the channel og listener to our podcast very happy to hear that our show is bringing some sanity to your crazy week as school starts and also i would like to give a shout out to our 300th downloader me yeah. no i'm kidding but larry thank you for listening he's a member of my uh, squadron on, in the Air Force Reserves, and he was nice enough to listen to the episode so everybody could listen to it, and I used to be respected there. <laughs> so thank you for that. 
Hey, Josh, just remember, you can't spell dishonorable discharge without honorable. <laughs> well, I, for one, would like to shout out to me, whose editing makes all of this magic happen. So thank you, me. You are really the person that holds this podcast together. Here we oh. go. Yeah, here we go again. I'm the yeah. editor. Thompson. As mentioned before, we realize you are beautiful. Now I'm turned uh, on. 20 bucks says that doesn't make it. What doesn't make it, Josh? And you're up. <laughs> Sorry, I had to cough. Hold up, hold up. Mm. Nigel's choking to death here. Apparently. He's giving so, that good ASMR of uh, him gulping. And my notepad is writing it to itself. The night Dan choked. Oh, Jesus. Oh, wait, no, it's just about all the times you flubbed your lines. Okay, you're fine. I'm the editor. As I became an adult, I know you are God. Anyways. <sighs> Reminder that you can find our podcast on Spotify, Amazon, iTunes, and Google, pretty much anywhere where you get your podcast from. Please subscribe to the podcast so that you get every single new episode on Tuesdays at 6 p.m., perfect for your Wednesday commute. If you enjoyed this episode or any of the others that you've listened to, please be sure to like, heart, favorite, whatever platform you're using. It really helps our channel grow, really helps us get us out there. We appreciate it. And uh, if you would like to interact with us and tell us every single way we are wrong, because we do make a lot of mistakes, and we are our own fact checkers, so we're not good at that either. You can find a link in the description at firep firepit.podbean.com to get an access to our, uh, an invite to our, uh... This is why you need me. <laughs> Power trip. Discord server. So feel free to log in and continue the chat, and we'd love to hear from you. We thank you again for listening, and until next week. I've been Dan. And I've been Josh. And I've been Tom. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. I told you a couple weeks ago, Josh, we can get rid of the interspersal host once we figure out how to get Tombot to stop talking about giving cocaine to children. Okay, yes, we, because he keeps segueing into that conversation and he won't let it go. I've been we tweaking to... him. He's only trying to give methamphetamines to kids now. I, but well, unfortunately, kids under three years old. So uh, baby still... steps, baby steps. Yeah, it, guys, literally baby steps. So guys, I'm oh. still on the call. Oh, there you go. <laughs>